I hope everything's okay. Thank you so much for inviting me to um, give this talk here. I'm an emergency physician. I'm not a technician and I'm not an informatics. So uh, maybe I'm a little bit exotic here, but I'm really happy to give some insights from just really from the medical side. So I'm going to talk about errors in medicine. And maybe if the technology as a support for the doctor can be helpful in the future to, get, to just put it together into one sentence, yeah, maybe, but we'll have to look into this. So um, what about errors in medicine? Just to give you some information about the evolution. So if you go back before the year 2000, before the report to Errors Human was published, errors in medicine had been mainly problems with machines. Like for example, a machine was not, walk, was not um, working probably or something was broken. So that's the definition of error before the year 2000. After 2000 in medicine with the report to Aries Human, um, doctors or people working in medicine realized that 70% of errors in medicine are a human problem. So basically they're human errors. And then we focused on this. And then for, for a couple of years, uh, human errors were like amputating the wrong leg or getting the wrong doses of a medication. And that again switched in 2015 when the next report, Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare, was published. And this report then again switched the focus from the broken machine, the human errors like doing mistakes, to wrong diagnosis. And that's not a simple thing to solve because diagnosis are a complex process that involves clinical reasoning, information gathering, and a lot of cognitive processes. So that's a difficult task to improve, but I think it's an important task. And everybody who is, who is working in medicine knows that getting the diagnosis right is the key thing in being a doctor. So how about errors in medicine? Diagnostic errors. My research team did a study a couple of years ago where we investigated the diagnosis we did in the emergency room and compared it to the diagnosis we took as the gold standard that the patient received after leaving the hospital. So gold standard is always a problem in the diagnostic error research because the gold standard is always um, difficult to define. But we compared the diagnosis made in the emergency room with the diagnosis made in hospital because they had a longer time and a lot of more information. And what did we find? We found that 12.3% Per, um, of our diagnosis were wrong. And if you think 12.3% diagnostic error is a large number, and you think, why is the boss of my department allowing me to, to give this talk with this number? That's because this number is actually quite good. Errors in medicine, diagnostic error, they differ, they, they are different for the different disciplines, and they can be between 5 to 35%. 35%, that's the range of emergency medicine. So 12.3 is quite okay for emergency medicine. 5%, that's for pathology. So so people having a lot of time and a lot of possibility to look into the patient. So those 12.3 errors, are they important for the patient? Yes, they are. We found that patient receiving an error in our department, they had a nearly doubled mortality and they had a nearly doubled hospital stay, length of hospital stay. So diagnostic errors are important, so we have to work on it. And as I want to cite this improving diagnosis in healthcare report, improving the diagnostic process represents a moral, professional, and public health imperative. So it's important. But if we look into the diagnostic errors, what are the main causes? We learned that mainly it's a human error, but why do the humans do those errors? They do it because they do an incomplete history, they fixate on the wrong diagnosis too early with a premature closure, they have a lack of knowledge and they ignore simply clinical findings if they don't fit into their bigger picture. If you just have a look at this list, you would say that maybe from your gut feeling lack of knowledge is the main problem, but it's not. Lack of knowledge is just one of a lot of problems. So if you look into this, digital things might help a lot with this. And if you Think about clinical decision aids. You can say, yeah, they can point to relevant questions. They can offer differential diagnosis somebody is maybe missing. They can close knowledge gaps if necessary, and they can even recommend diagnostic steps. So from the theoretical side, those digital decision aids and those digital tools are the ideal thing to prevent those human errors. But are they? We will have to look into this. 
just to give you an impression, diagnostic or decision support internationally, it's used. So it's just reality. Ada, for example, a company from Germany, it's two more than 15 billion visits a month. Uh, more than half of the patients in Germany use those tools prior to contacting any kind of healthcare system. And most interesting, even more use it after consulting a physician. So maybe we have to just talk about physician communication also. But it's a reality. So we have to deal with it. But do those tools actually work? If you look into what's published about is, you will realize that the conditions investigated, they are really specific. So those tools are tested with specific conditions normally. And that's not the reality in the emergency department. In the emergency department, it's a broad variety of conditions and a broad variety of symptoms and diagnosis. So those tests are from this point of view, not really, really ideal. And if you even look in those specific conditions that are, have been investigated, you find that most of the studies find no difference in primary outcome. So research, we don't know. And if, but those are only the research that had been done. If you, for example, take a list, a published list about those decision aids, and if you look into this, there are more than half of them without any published studies done. So we just assume that they work. And if you look into those studies that had been done. You will realize that most of them are not studies being done with real patients. Most of, most of them are just vignette studies. Vignette studies means that you use not real patient data that can be really, really messy and incomplete, but you use vignettes. So you create cases like this one I present here, where all the information is just put together and you test the tools with this. And of course, that's much easier than the real patients. But even in those vignette studies. If you look at this, that's the vignette of bacterial pneumonia, uh, uh, lung infection with sepsis. This is counted correct in most of those studies if either pneumonia or sepsis is within the three or five first differential diagnosis. And if this tool recommends, for example, if this correct diagnosis is pneumonia with sepsis, that it might be also a pulmonary embolism, a blood clot in the lung, or maybe also a heart problem, left ventricular failure, or diverticulitis, an abdominal problem. Yeah, but sepsis is within the first three, and you count this right. What would you think if a doctor comes up with those differentials for one of your problems? Would you call this a good diagnosis? I don't think so. So again, what does the literature say? If you look into the meta-analysis published, there are two, one from 2016, which interestingly doesn't find any improved diagnostic accuracy, and another one from 2019, where Patterson included 42 studies with a uh, in 83% positive effect. But he also said it's a very heterogeneous outcome and a very mixed study quality and a lot of research needs to be done to, to, um, to see if this finding really is correct. You can read yourself. They su suggest it's effective, but they're small and they're po poorly controlled. So a lot of more research needs to be done. And that gets even worse if you look into the economic effects of those tools. There is no meta-analysis existing about this, so I brought just uh, some studies with me. For example, one randomized outpatient trial of a decision support information technology tool that found that it's getting more expensive with this tool. So it's maybe helping with the diagnosis, but it needs more laboratory and pharmacy resources than usual care and it gets more expensive. Or in this evaluation of an artificial intelligence based grading of a diabetic retinopathy in primary care, that's a study from Western Australia. They saw patients with diabetes and what did they find? They found there's a positive predictive value of only 12%. And that means that many false positives are there and they are expensive. And it's most often just simply image quality problem. 
Are symptom checkers any better? So those decision aids, they're designed for the doctors, for the medical professionals. The symptom checkers are designed for the patients. So the patient can just give their symptoms and get a diagnosis or recommendation. There is only one meta-analysis available from Semicon et al. And it also assesses vignettes. It invests in, it assesses vignettes and it founds only a correct diagnosis in 34% of cases, which is actually not really good, isn't it? And what factors affect this diagnostic accuracy? Luckily, frequent diagnoses are diagnosed better. And luckily, the more life-threatening emergencies are also diagnosed better in comparison to self-care cases. So that's a little bit assuring because that means that the dangerous diagnoses are diagnosed better. Just to give a little special impact uh, or just a let little special insights into what we did with the COVID-19 situation. In Switzerland, we had a largely, uh, uh, a, a really large component of fear among the public. With those exponentially rising case numbers and frequent changes in testing criteria in Switzerland, the people just simply were confused. And if you look into the literature, there's only one published in from the swine flu from a couple of years ago where online triage tool prevented a lot of ER visits and it is said that it can help with people dealing with fear and uncertainty. So we integrated one of our tools, one of those online triage tools in the Swiss population and we had a lot of visits. Switzerland is a small country so 15,000 visits in a couple of weeks is good for us and we found that uh, we can monitor what the testing criteria changes in the policy level has an effect in, on our recommendations. So we had, for example, one change in testing criteria quite early, which brought down the test recommendations from about 50% to about 10%. And that's something which, that wasn't monitored by the authorities in our country before. So these tools can not only help on the patient level to inform the patient, but it can also give a feedback loop to the authorities what their recommendations really mean for the patients. You can also, for example, help with allocation of testing resources, but because we can say what's the percentage of testing recommendation throughout Switzerland. So we can say over the time, people from Eastern Switzerland are more likely to get tested now, but now it switches to the eastern parts or other parts of Switzerland. So we can help with allocation of resources also. To summarize, from the theoretical point of view, those computer as diagnostic decision support systems, they hold great promises and they also make them. Make them. Real research generally doesn't support those claims, but the research is really limited. So we definitely urgently need more research because the people are using it on a large scale. Those CDDS, they have a role in high specific situation, but the economic impact is absolutely not clear. So bottom line, I would recommend use those tools, but also do research. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions.